I'm supposed to stand here and be appropriately amplified for posterity. Uh, hopefully it works. So anyway, uh, it's harder to point from this angle, but what I'm going to talk about is both a code and its applications. So basically we have RMG, it's a real space multigrid code, which is a large scale density functional code. It's on Blue Waters Community Portal as well as on SourceForge and other places, I'll give you pointers. It is also part of sustained petascale performance benchmark. So you should uh, uh, hopefully will perform well even on other, on future architectures, it performs well on a number of architectures as you are going to see. And I'm going to show you two applications to silicon nanowire ba based sensors for potential DNA sequencing and also where we are doing very large 12,000 12, atom calculations. We are also going to talk about nanoscale transistors and those are kinds of keywords that we'll discuss, uh, telling you what's ahead. So first, what is the real space multigrid? We, s we are solving the so-called density functional equations of the quantum equations with which people solve the property for the properties of the material directly on a grid. So I'm using a dense grid as a basis. And then we are using coarsened grid to accelerate convergence. Basically, numerical analysis can show that one can propagate much more efficiently the boundary conditions on a coarser grid because the jumps are larger. But also, and more importantly, convergence is accelerated because only oscillatory arrows iterate down quickly. The ones that are long wavelength do not. They become oscillator on the scale of these grids, so they accelerate quickly. And we go basically between up and down between those grids to accelerate fast. The code is highly parallel. Here you see performance on a large number of nodes. It's open source. We will be, we have quantum transport code. I'm going to show you results for quantum transport that's going to be released later during the year. We are basically hardening that code and also making it more user friendly. We have run on multi petaflops. There is a web page on less than 4,000 Cray XK7 nodes. We already are over a petaflop sustained performance. So you understand why we are part of the peta petascale benchmarks. Now, what can you get downloads? You can get downloads here, or you can get downloads for the, for the uh, portal from Blue Waters. Also, a version of the code is here together with executable, it, not with executable, but with examples, output file, etc. You can, you can compare that. There is a graphical user interface. There is examples, documentation, and discussion. This is the starting website for the uh, for the code, but it connects to SourceForge. OK, there have been about 2,000 downloads. There's, you can get help installing, etc. How does it do? In materials physics, the codes that are used most often for material simulations are based on plane waves. We are going to compare here to PWSCF, which is a very good, very well regarded code that has been developed a while back, but it's continuously being both updated and optimized. So it's not that we are uh, uh, comparing to either an old code or a code that is not being continuously developed. It's a very active user community there. But because of real space grids, because of the way we are doing parallelization, we are performing a lot faster here. In particular, the number of nodes gets increased. I could go into details of the algorithms and why this thing goes up. Basically, the fastest method there is a little bit unstable. In PWS, if we are using multigrids, which is more stable and faster. Uh, now, the question about GPUs. OK, I told you about CPUs, GPUs, etc. Well, a CPU is high clock speed, smaller number of powerful execution units. It's very good for single thread performance because, because the clock speed is very fast. You are basically limited by the memory bandwidth, which can be hidden by caches and order of execution. So that's when you saw Jack Dongara stock, for example, that the single, single thread and memory bandwidth was very, very important. 
what a GPU is good for. They are good for if you kind of have single instruction, multiple data type of stream. Slow clock speed, but now you can afford many, many units and you can go in a parallel, you can have many, many threads, but if you have an if statement, clearly it's going to go slowly. So you need to, better to execute this here. We have a large fraction of RMG database on the GPU. For large data sets, it will work better there, much better, turns out. For smaller data sets, CPU will win. So here you see an example of CPU versus GPU on Cray XE, in other words, without GPU, and Cray XK with, GP with GPU, and you could see a large speed up here. And you can also see that more than 32 GPUs is too, too many for that problem. So that won't work. So then you, you don't get a gain. Now one thing, uh, as you might have uh, known, NVIDIA developed a new Pascal GPU, which they started to sell or ship in March, and we got one of the first units they actually shipped it to us. And two days after they shipped it to us, the code was working, and we had got a speed up of almost a factor of five with one GPU. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Now that GPU has five teraflops of single, of double precision performance. The Volta GPU that was announced a couple of days ago is twice the speed. So you could see here the tremendous advantage if the code can run, can run on those. And we have not yet optimized for the new GPUs. How does it do on a say large, large, large supercomputer type problem, but now we are going to previous generations of GPUs. This is the this is on the blue waters, and we are comparing first here scaling without GPUs, and we have one GPU data point here, and you can see that there is still a signif significant gain. By the way, this exactly exact example with 4,000 atoms, uh, 18,000 orbitals, spin polarized, etc., part of a quantum computing candidate, that's the SPP, sustained petascale performance benchmark, that's on the website now here. So we'll see how it will do on the next generation architectures of NSF's track, track one system. It would be very interesting to compare. You can also see that we are getting large fractions of peak performance. How that's going to remain given the new architectures, faster memories, but again, much faster CPUs and GPUs, we'll see. Now let's now turn to applications. The first application here is trying to monitor DNA replication and use DNA replication to potentially sequence DNA. So let me give you an example here. There's an enzyme called polymerase one and clan of fragment of it will replicate a single strand DNA by simply grabbing another strand of it, a, a, a complementary base pair, attach it together, move it up, attach it again together, move it up, attach it together. So it ref replicates very fast with high repetition rate, no errors, because we all want to have two eyes and not, not more and not, no less. And you see an experiment here where with these fragments attached to a nanotube, they are seeing a signal, an electrical signal monitoring current through a nanotube when this is either open, in other words, not synthesizing or closed, it staples the base pair together and then it moves up and then staples the next pair. The pair, the complementary nucleotide adds from the solution. So we worked on that actually together experimentally. They found that by changing it, uh, the nucleotides here making atomic substitutions, it turned out that one could actually have slightly different signals here, which potentially would lead to electrical identification of what their pairs adding. And if you have electrical identification, then you have sequenced as you monitor that current. But it turned out not quite. We added gate scanning there, and one could, and we can I identify T and G. You can also say that it's either C and or A. 
we only need to identify four, right? C, G, T, and A. But we cannot distinguish between C and A. We did those calculations. Still have to write it up. But the next question is, can one use something that's not a nanotube, which a nanotube has to be carefully positioned, has to be, they can be produced in quantity, but they're entangled. I, it's kind of hard to make those sensors. From silicon, one could make it. So the question is, can one use a silicon nanowire? It turns out that it is possible. Here I'll tell you a little bit about the calculations. Now we are calculating the current, so that quantity here, integrating over the so-called transmission and Fermi factors. And this is kind of a many-body Green's function type approach. You are either in that business or you need to read more. But it parallelizes very, very well. Again, we have full multi-core and multi-GPU support. It scales to thousands of nodes. We can do those calculations. And here you see some examples. Here is something where you can barely see individual atoms. We have gold contacts here. We have a silicon nanowire. Now, silicon is not a nanotube. It has to be passivated. So it is passivated with aluminum oxide. So we have a yard of 10,000 of 10, atoms. We get transmissions for, and we get current, we can, uh, we can get both, trans uh, this is a transmission versus energy, this is current versus energy. You see, you see the gaps, things are working. The question is, will one be able to detect opening and closure? We have not yet experimented with nucleot nucleotides, so I ident identify the change in current divided by the, by the normalized by the size of the current. And here act I'm actually showing two, two results. One is for a short nanowire, where it turns out that there's leakage current everywhere. You might have heard that silicon technology is going to stop by stop at five nanometers. This kind of shows why you have a too short a nanowire, you have a tunneling current no matter what, pretty high. If we go to five nanometers, which, which is what I showed you, we actually have acceptable sensitivity, which is good enough, and we no longer see a very large uh, leakage current. So one has to be at about five nanometers length, a channel length for it to work. We verified it another way. And here's another configuration where we simply have a slab on top of an insulating, insulating surface. And that's, uh, that's important because the uh, slabs one can edge from above. OK, so now this could be a surface device or many surface devices. And it turns out that here it would also work. One has, it works and has fairly high sensitivities at sub-threshold voltage. Now, you might have heard that Intel is proposing sub-threshold devices. Well, it will work, but the currents are very, very small, good for power, but ne not so good for detection. If you now turn to a, to a larger width and to a turn-on state, in other words, at higher gate, one has still acceptable sensitivity, but the currents are large, they can be detected. So that would work. Now let's turn to example two. And that work, it's working with graphene and nanoscale devices for post Moore's law era. So here we have a simple Gedanken device, a nano ribbon, in other words, a ribbon of graphene connected to do two graphene electrodes. Now, if you make something small, and the reason to go to graphene is to make very small devices. Turns out that one has quantum interference patterns. In other words, this distance here generates standing waves, and there are various quantum numbers that one could assign on it, and it depend, they depend on length, width, index of a graphene nanoribbon, et cetera. There could also be localized states, as I'm going to show you. So we tried many ribbons, many widths, and many lengths, I'll show you some results. It turns out that nanoribbons can be characterized by their width, by their width modulo 3. So it turns out that this modulo 3, width modulo 3, 
should be mod, not mode. Is when it's zero, we have a reasonable gap. Things behave fine. This one, mod one, has a uh, has an even larger gap. But see where those extra states. Those extra states disappear as we make the nanoribble longer. So we can make them disappear, but on the other hand, you don't want to have a very long device because you want to have highly packed devices. So that's not so good. And finally, when uh, mode is two, you have very, we have a very narrow gap that's not so good. So well, things should work, at least for, for this one. Will it work? Here you have a transistor, where a Gedanken transistor, if you wish, where we use graphene uh, electrodes. We only use two boron nitrate in insulating layers. That's kind of enough. And then an aluminum gate. And we do get a quite nice transistor curve. So that's fine. Okay, those kind of devices should work. Obviously, we need to still design contacts and other things. But you know, for beyond Moore's law, that's that's good. So that's actually, I'm going to finish reasonably on time. I see here, let me give you a summary. I could give you more details, but that's not the uh, purpose of the talk. I wanted to leave you with two messages. One is that we have a petaflops capable open source electronic structure code that you are welcome to use. Scales to 20k nodes, 200 uh, k GPUs, it, uh, CPUs, sorry, GPUs, one per node, or multiple GPUs per node. They'll both work, and they work well. We provide you with Cray installation files on Blue Waters. It's already installed. We have it. We also give you Linux, Windows, and Mac binaries and sources so that you can install it in your system. If you have trouble, contact us. We'll help you. On Blue Waters, it is installed, and it sits on Blue Waters Community por Portal. And also, it's part of su sustained petaflop scale performance benchmark, so you can download that part and see if it runs. For the peta scale performance, you better have a somewhat big box, otherwise it's it's going to choke. As long as memory is enough, it's going to run, of course. I showed you two applications, monitoring of DNA replication. There's a potential for DNA sequencing here, which is worth exploring. As you know, DNA can be sequenced, but it's kind of it's chopped up, attached to markers, then kind of integrated over statistical analysis, lots of work, straightforward sequencing, electrical would be nice, but it would be even nicer if it worked. Right now, it's we're still working on it, and then we talked about nanoscale devices for post Moore's law era. Nano ribbon based transistors are feasible. There is uh, a program on atomically precise electronics, which we are part of, etc. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Be happy to answer questions.